I'm the uh, transport policy lead for the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority, and I'm a, a town planner by background, so much less exciting, I'm afraid, than, uh, than anything rugby related. Uh, let's not talk about Wales and England. At the <laughs> <laughs> let's just leave that well alone, shall we? Uh, but uh, thanks very much for the, for the opportunity just to, to paint the picture uh, about our journey towards net zero carbon transport and clean transport in the Liverpool City Region. I'll explain what Liverpool City Region means if it's a term that you're not familiar with. Uh, and do I press this one to advance? Yes, I do. There we go. And just to set the scene. So where we were established from was a devolution deal back in 2015, uh, which put the wheels in motion for us to establish a formal statutory combined authority for the Liverpool City Region. What's combined authority? It's effectively a strategic level body that brings together lots of functions uh, that otherwise don't sit terribly neatly at a local authority level, so things like transport, things like economic development, things like skills, things like employment, things that don't really respect administrative boundaries. So Steve Rotherham, as our, as our Metro Mayor, as our directly elected Metro Mayor, has high level responsibility for a large number of themes, uh, of which transport is one, my, my area of, of interest. Um, and has these, these wide responsibilities for um, a body covering a million and a half people across the Liverpool City region. It's made up of six constituent local authorities, as you can see. So just picking up on the earlier comment, you know, Liverpool, as the city of Liverpool, is right in the heart there. But equally, we have five other local authorities that equally make up the, the combined authority. We're all on this side of the water. Sefton to the north, going up towards Southport, for those of you that don't know the area. Nosley, which includes uh, Highton, Halewood, Kirby, uh, St Helens, uh, the, the town, the borough of St Helens, and then Holton, effectively the two towns of Witness and Runcorn, uh, either side of the River Mersey. So that's the geography of the city region, uh, with, with Steve Rotherham as our directly elected mayor with those strategic responsibilities. There are, as I say, I'm responsible for transport, but the mayor is also responsible for other themes, other areas, homelessness, economic development, as I touched on, employment and skills, spatial planning. So what we have as combined authority in policy terms, in funding terms, is the tools to bring lots of different areas together. So whereas a problem in the past has always been kind of energy, transport, planning, skills, all being done in little silos, despite best efforts, we now have a better chance of being able to pull those, those issues together more coherently as a city region. And as part of Steve Rotherham's commitments, that's his manifesto there on the right from a couple of years ago, uh, Steve is very, very passionate about uh, improving our environment, uh, about becoming net zero carbon by 2040. That's an explicit manifesto pledge. And we declared climate emergency uh, back in the summer, as did many of, us, our, uh, many of our constituent local authorities, <coughs> in recognition of the, the priority to decarbonise and to deal with the climate challenges that we have. Pollution's a really interesting issue. Um, in that it's changed. It's not gone away, but it's changed. And if you start here on the left, I hope this, uh, this stands out okay, but kind of back in the 40s and 50s, the problems that we had were, were quite different from the problems we have now. Sulfur dioxide, soot, you know, we burnt coal. Uh, we, uh, we, we burnt coal to power our railways and our steam trains. And we had, you know, blackened buildings. We had acid rain and lots of other problems. Back in the 1960s to the 1980s, that changed more to things like carbon monoxide, lead. Lead was a big problem when we had four-star, three-star petrol. Uh, seems hard to believe now, doesn't it, that we, we freely bought you know, petrol that, uh, that had these appalling carcinogens in. But uh, that has mercifully now all been, been moved to history. But lead, ozone, those were the big problems of the, of the 1980s. But to the present day, we've kind of moved from the, the sooty stuff uh, to something that's pretty much invisible, unfortunately, you know, nitrogen dioxide in particular, <laughs> um, which typically come from, they come from industry, sure, they come from our homes, absolutely, but increasingly coming from transport, you know, as car use has grown, as van use has grown, HGV use has grown, and, you know, we're using the railways less and less for freight, then those particulate emissions and those uh, nitrogen dioxide emissions have gone up and up over time, as you can see there. So the problem's shifted. That's what we've really got. Nitrous oxide, uh, this is the, the real nasty that comes from burning petrol and diesel typically. You know, this is what comes from our, from our vehicles, from our transport network. Uh, and whilst there's a positive picture there, you can see that you know, emissions are coming down. That's from 1990, that's back to 2015. And particularly you know, emissions from industry are coming down as we're moving away from coal-fired coal -fired power stations to, to alternatives. 
we've still got a pretty stubborn chunk there with transport sources. Um, even though it's bottomed out there from about 2009-10, you can see that there's still a pretty stubborn uh, green block at the bottom there, which is the emissions from transport, from road transport, passenger cars, rail aviation, and shipping. That's really a, a stubborn problem that is still causing real issues for us. Uh, nitrous oxide is a particularly nasty pollutant, you know, it irritates the chest, it causes harm to respiratory systems and lots of other uh, problems besides. There's more and more evidence coming out all the time about what air pollution causes, you know, even going now to antisocial behaviour, uh, real, real concerns. And because a lot of these problems are invisible, I think what, uh, what Transport for London, and this is an example from Transport for London, if, you, if you're on the tube, you see quite a few of these around, what they've done is to bring about some pretty hard-hitting images to raise the profile of this, that's, it says here, if you could see London's air, you'd want to clean it too. And, you know, the, the baby's bottle there with grim black stuff on that you can't otherwise see. Uh, I think raising awareness is a, is a key part of, of this problem. Because of our problems as a city region, we have uh, what are defined as air quality management areas. So where, where pollution exceeds a specific standard, ultimately derives from Europe, then local authorities have to declare an air quality management area to deal with that. We have 11 of those across the city region. So again, there's that map of the Liverpool city region as a whole that you saw earlier. And there are air quality management areas in most of those boroughs, bar two. The whole of Liverpool is, is one air quality management area, and Colleen will talk more about Liverpool's plans uh, very shortly, so I won't steal any thunder there. But typically, the problems we have in the city region are transport-related. That's why they've been declared. It's nitrogen dioxide. It's back to that pollutant on the right-hand side of the chart that I showed you. There are some problems with particulate matters, particularly in Sefton, uh, some of these air quality management areas around the port where there's some industrial usage, uh, but typically a lot of our problem is down to transport. It's a transport-related issue. And carbon, you know, the other side of the coin, really, when we're talking about climate emergency and zero carbon, we've still got a big carbon challenge. You know, I said Steve Rotherham's ambition is to be net zero carbon uh, by 2040, but these are the carbon dioxide emissions as a city region. You can see in that little bar chart on the left there, transport emissions are going in the wrong direction. Um, and it's still pretty stubborn, you know, third, third, third pretty much with industry and domestic emissions. We've got a challenge there. And again, if you look at it in just a slightly different way there on total transport emissions on the little chart on the right, sure, we're below England, we're below the north of England, um, which on one hand is, is good, you know, there's, we're not as bad as other areas, uh, relatively speaking, but it's still dipping in the wrong direction, we're still going in the wrong direction there, rather than dipping as we'd want it to do. We've developed, through the Mayor, through the Command Authority, a transport plan um, to kind of pull together our various aspirations for cleaner, better, greener transport across the city region. Uh, this is just to exemplify the, the sort of objectives that have gone into it. I'm not going to read through these. You, I think we can, we can circulate these and you can read the slides and read the plan at your leisure, should you wish to. Uh, but there are five objectives there. And the plan is about you know, getting people into work, getting people into employment, getting into education. That's what transport's all about. But equally, it's about delivering better transport through a new mobility culture, as we call it. So transport is clean, it's modern, it's inclusive. We focus on healthy forms of transport. We improve health and well-being. Uh, we create livable places. Uh, and we address the challenges of poor air quality and support the move to a net zero carbon LCR by 2040. So it's more than just transport in isolation, as you can see from that. It's about the place. It's about what sort of Liverpool city region we want. So what sort of policies have we got as a combined authority, as a city region, for tackling these, these problems that I've described? A big one is making mass transit the mode of choice. It's, it's very obvious, but it's you know, modal shift, put another way. It's getting people out of their cars. It's those single-person single, single person car journeys, particularly those journeys to work at the worst times of the day when the roads are, there, are at their busiest or when there's lots of school children around. So kind of moving people onto more sustainable forms of transport, onto the bus, onto the train, onto the ferries in our case here as well. Local and national rail, we're very lucky. We have Mersey Rail here in the Liverpool city region, an electrified rail network. It's the jewel in our, in our transport crown, uh, for those of you that have seen it. It was planned with great foresight back in the 1960s when Liverpool was you know, economically in the doldrums, but our partners had the, the foresight, really, to, to put this wonderful system in that is still reaping dividends today. It's an electrified network, you know, zero emission at, uh, at, at source, um, and we are enhancing that network all the time through new stations, but specifically now through a new programme of replacing the rolling stock. Rolling stock, the trains are now about 40 years old, 
and we're going to replace them outright starting from this year with state-of-the-art electric trains that we will own. That's quite unique as well. But I think what's really significant here is the potential for these new trains to be much more efficient and much more um, dynamic in how they work. One of the things we're putting into the train spec is a provision for the trains built to extend off the electrified rail network, off the third rail network. So we are hoping to take forward a pilot fairly shortly that would allow these new trains, or certainly to trial using these new trains, uh, using batteries so that they could extend off the existing electrified network. Potentially, you know, we have ambitions to go to Skelmersdale, we have ambitions to go to Wrexham, ambitions to go to Warrington, so beyond the sort of confines of the city region to be able to make the rail offer more attractive and more inclusive. Um, it's quite an interesting one when you're looking at rail and electrification. The, the policy has shifted nationally. Uh, governments less, much less keen on electrification than they were. Costs have escalated. We have a third rail network which the, the rail regulators don't like very much. Uh, they're very considered quite dangerous and you've got to fence them off and there's a, you know, a very obvious um, risk there for people with 750 <coughs> volts on the side of the, of the rail network. So battery and more innovative ways of making that rolling stock move is going to be the way forward uh, as we want to expand the network rather than putting down more third rail kit can we do that by using battery power potentially using hydrogen in the future you know that that's all in the mix buses are part of the air quality problem are, not, are part of the air quality solution uh sorry slip there <laughs> and i was trying to i put this i put this point in to avoid a myth that we always get, which is that buses are part of the air quality problem. Uh, people see buses as big things with big diesel engines, so ergo they must be part of the problem. We're very clear that the bus is part of the solution to air quality. We need to be getting more people using the bus. The buses can carry many, many more people. They're much more efficient per head. And through investment that has been made over successive years, more and more buses are becoming hybrid. They're moving to alternative fuels. They're an awful lot cleaner than they were Euro 5, Euro 6 now. So the bus is very much part of that solution to stress. Um, but making the bus more attractive through uh, journey time reliability, absolutely key. You know, I use the bus to get to work in the morning. I live seven miles away and it can take an hour sometimes because the bus is stuck in traffic. So through a, pro a funding programme that we have now, Transforming Cities, uh, colleagues are working hard to, to make the bus much more attractive by getting through the congestion, giving the bus the priority that it needs to make it a viable proposition. Active travel, walking and cycling, we must not overlook this at all. And as a city region, we are committed to a mass increase in walking and cycling. There is no cleaner, healthier, low-carbon way of moving around than walking and cycling, other than perhaps what you might eat or, or what your bike is made out of, if you're looking at it, at it in terms of the whole life cycle. But that is one of the best ways you can travel for so many reasons. But equally, and why we're here today, you know, greening petrol and diesel systems is critical. Huge amounts of work done in the past on electric vehicles. We want to see more of that happening. Uh, roll out of a hydrogen bus network. We have funding from OLEV to hopefully pilot 25 or 30 uh, hydrogen powered buses. Um, clean freight, you know, the f we are a port city. We have big logistics um, facilities across the city region. The last mile, the white van problem is an issue for all of us as it is across the country. We want to do something about that. Um, but we're also looking at and aware of problems around you know, grid capacity as we've been talking about today that much as we'd like to be able to plug some of these cruise liners or plug some of these ships into the grid, we'd probably take out Liverpool city centre, which uh, nobody's going to thank us for, so building that capacity so that we can have the, the cold ironing and so forth that's needed, but equally having that infrastructure that's so important so you can fill up your car with hydrogen or you can fill up your, your car with, with juice, whatever, whatever form that takes. Traffic management, this is one that we must not overlook as well, very similar to the bus analogy that I gave, making sure that you know, the cleanest forms of transport can get through the traffic. You're incentivising the pedestrian, the cyclist, the public transport user. And finally, smart cities. The, it's very, very, very much a, a sort of buzz term these days, smart cities. You know, what, what's a smart city? I think for me it's about a city where people can make smart decisions. Technology, information, uh, telematics, autonomy, that wasn't me, are, um, are making it easy to make the right decisions. So here's an example, you know, you're driving an electric vehicle off peak, you've got four people in the car. It's not beyond the wit to assume that traffic management systems could take you to the most convenient car park for the lowest cost to reward you for that behaviour. So for me, that's kind of the smart city uh, to incentivise good behaviour, if you like. Sounds a bit patronising. Uh, but hearts and minds are such an important part of the transport agenda. You know, changing, if we're going to shift to low carbon, cleaner fuels, it's about hearts and minds. You know, it's a, it's a long-term process. 
And you know, this, is, this is one I use quite often, uh, just to remind us, really, about how far we've come uh, and what we need to do. Um, smoking, this was 50 years ago. You know, your doctor used to recommend which brand of cigarette to smoke. Uh, for goodness sake, you know, smoking is now pretty much illegal and they cost £10 a pack and they come in horrible green packets that warn you just how dangerous it is. We've come a huge long way through hearts and minds and concerted publicity campaigns and awareness and that's what's brought that about. And the same needs to happen with transport and energy and home insulation and all the rest to make hearts and minds make this stuff happen. And I think what's important for our transport plan and for our green transport agenda full stop is that there is not a, again, a horrible buzzword, but a one-size-fits-all solution. So it's not just about making com internal combustion engines electric or hydrogen and just replacing them like for like. No, it's, it's part of the modal shift agenda. It's the walking and cycling agenda. So you need all the pieces in the mix is what this is showing us. So absolutely you need the hydrogen bus. You need the electric charging points. You need the move to electric vehicles. You need the move to electric vans, the Mersey Rail initiative that I talked about there. But equally, some of these smaller uh, plans here you know, what sort of place do we design? So, you know, that's a typical nondescript out-of-town shopping centre. Perhaps I'm interested in that. I'm a planner, you know, but they are not conducive to using public transport to walking and cycling. They're built around the needs of the car. We need to move away from that way of developing and building places. You know, it's not human. It's not, it's not delivering the change that we need. And equally, some great examples from London there on the right through their, through their Living Healthy Streets programme, just about reprioritising streets, streets for people rather than streets for cars and streets for trucks so important and some great ideas for us to take forward all these are part of the mix and i think this is all about avoiding unintended consequences you know and this is this is aimed really at diesel uh, 10 years ago 11 years ago we were all incentivized to buy diesel you know there were scrappage schemes to encourage us to do that diesel was the solution um, diesel was good for carbon yeah but it's bad for nox we'd forgotten about that and it's bad for particulates especially if you fix the results all that has come out we're all wiser sadly because of these problems but the whole issue of unintended consequences and kind of moving from what we have now to a clean congestion problem is one to avoid at all costs, hence the move to all those different forms of transport that I showed you in the previous slide. And really, this is all about making the Liverpool city region and enhancing it as the wonderful, attractive Liverpool city region that it is, with its wonderful historic buildings that are not blighted by pollution and traffic and all the disbenefits that go with that. We want to build on our successes. We want to create livable places. And really, that's all I was going to say for today, so I hope that was okay. Wonderful. Thank you.